Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you a conversation with my recurring guest, Barbara Carnes, hospice nurse and international speaker and educator. Barbara and I have a great conversation about non-ordinary experiences at the end of life, like deathbed visions and dreams and terminal lucidity. I think you'll really enjoy it. So stay tuned for that. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and sign up for notifications so you can find out whenever I post something new. Also subscribe and leave a rating and review for the podcast wherever you happen to listen. I want to let you know that if you go to the podcast page at eolupodcast.com, I have some merchandise available for this podcast, like this end of life university mug that says love your life. And there's lots of other things on that page you can find if you're interested in repping the podcast and offering a little bit of support in that way. You can also go to eoluniversity.com slash support. There you'll find three different ways you can make contributions to help keep this podcast on the air. And I thank you in advance for doing that. So we'll move on now with my conversation with Barbara Carnes. Today, I'm so happy to welcome back my recurring guest, Barbara Carnes. And if you've heard her before, you know all about Barbara's wonderful work. She is a hospice nurse and international speaker and educator. She's the author of the Little Blue Hospice book that everyone in hospice, I'm sure, has seen um, called Gone From My Sight. And she has actually has, a has what, 11 or 12 books out there, book lists that are wonderful um, for grief, for uh, caregivers. And her, her latest book is By, By Your Side. Is that correct, Barbara? Okay, I got that right. Um, uh, which is a book for caregivers all about taking care of a loved one at the end of life. And it's a wonderful resource book for people. And her website is bkbooks.com. So Barbara, thanks for joining me again today. It's so good to see you. It's always good to be here. We always have such good conversations. So looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Me too. I, I love getting into, into these discussions with you. Today, I wanted to talk about um, when our hospice patients have, I guess what we could call non-ordinary experiences at the end of life shortly before they die. And those of us who've worked in hospice a long time have seen all kinds of of these experiences happen for patients. And it's really important that we talk about them so everyone understands um, that they're common and normal and has a sense of how to talk to family members about it who sometimes might be frightened or worried when, when they see their loved one having an experience. And so one of the things we're talking about here are just people who seem to be having visions, deathbed visions. And I, I've seen it, I'm sure you have, of a patient who they appear to be talking to someone in the room that no one else can see, or they even tell you that they saw someone and were visited by someone. And so you, you can share with us some of your experiences around that, Barbara. Well, the first one that comes to mind is my own mother. Um, she, she lived in our house for the last five months of her life. And I set up a hospital bed in our living room because stairs were an issue. And I'm in the kitchen, which is right off the living room. And I hear her talking and there's no one in the house, but her and I. And so I listened to her and she says, I see you. I see you peeking in the window. So talk to a person. Um, they're a window into their world. So I said to mother, who are you talking to? She said, there's an angel out on the porch who keeps peeking in the window. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about the angel and she wasn't afraid of the angel. It was, she's playing hide and seek with me. That angel over the next few weeks came into the living room and my mother would say, I see you peeking around the corner. And that angel 
finally landed on her pillow. Mm, wow. And so you can see the progression and people are a window into the other world, a window into their world. And so I talk to them, tell me about what's going on. Um, it, it's beautiful. Now, I have to say, sometimes it's scary. Sometimes people are scared. Um, and then again, I'm going to talk to them and try and calm and reassure and support them. I think that's fear. I think that's their fear projected out into what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I, I've sometimes seen experiences when the patient is very comfortable with what has happened, but family members or even staff are uncomfortable and don't know how to interpret it. And I remember one of our patients who ended up being admitted to a nursing home because he didn't have a full-time caregiver at home. And for the last couple of weeks of his life was in a nursing home where the staff was not as familiar um, with working with a hospice patient. And the staff found him like every night, he would talk to someone named John, who was in his room, and they called me and said, your patient is having hallucinations, we think he's sundowning, and he, you know, we need an antipsychotic medication for him at night. And, and I came in to talk to him. And it turns out John was his brother who had died five years earlier. And he said, I'm arguing with John right now. And I said, Oh, what's, what's, what's that about? What's going on? He said, John wants me to come with him and I'm not ready. And I, so I told him just back off and stay away. I'll come when I'm ready to come. And so I met with the nursing home staff and talked to them about that and said, this is just a normal experience for people at the end of life. We see it often because um, I, I was really nervous about them trying to give him a medication and then also telling his family, you know, something's wrong with something's wrong with your brother because he's, ha you know, he's hearing and seeing things that aren't there. So it's so important that we talk about it and normalize it so everyone knows not to overreact or get upset when these things happen. Well, and to not think that something pathological is happening. And people who are not familiar with working with end of life, people, healthcare professionals, that their job is to get people better, uh, then, yeah, hallucinations are a whole different thing. But we who work in end of life understand that they're a window into the other world. Nothing bad is happening. Nothing pathological is happening. And that's where our education tools come in so that we teach the family that Dad's doing what he's supposed to be doing. This is perfectly normal. And his brother's here now. And isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And in, in those cases, um, I've read studies that it, it can be really helpful for family members and their subsequent grief when they recognize, oh, well, maybe this is happening for him. Like there are there are people coming for him and he's not alone right now. And that's helping, that's helping the patient feel safer and more comfortable with this process. And it's nice if the family members can just embrace it. Like it isn't, isn't this wonderful that our dad doesn't feel alone and he's not frightened. In fact, he's happy about this experience that he's having. Oh, it's so reassuring. I think one of my most um, what do I want to say? Touching, uh, beautiful. Um, it stayed with me all these years is I took care of a young woman, um, who died. She had a two year old son and her mother and father took the boy and raised him. Mom died from AIDS, and it was at a time when we didn't understand. It was in the 80s. We didn't understand um, 
And the little guy was considered a failure to thrive. He, he was just this beautiful angel looking child. Um, I don't even have words to describe how beautiful he was. So mom dies. Grandma's taking care of the little guy. And I stayed in contact with that family. And at some point she called me and she said, we need you now for, I'll make up his name. We need you now for Billy. Hmm. And in that two year time frame, the doctors had then diagnosed him not with failure to thrive, but that he was born with HIV. Hmm. And so he's now four years old and he's dying. And we held him in a bedroom, little bedroom, in a rocking chair in the hours before he died. And he's, you know, we're holding him and his eyes are partially open and he's just laying there. And all of a sudden, he, oh, he kind of perked up and he opened his eyes wide and he, he starts looking around the room. It was like he was searching for something. You could just feel he's looking for something. And I thought it feels like this room is filled with people that I can't see or hear. And then he raised his hand, his arm, and he pointed to the far corner of this little bedroom and called mom by name. Oh, wow. And he stayed focused on that corner until he took his last breath. You can't wow. tell me that mom wasn't there along with dad and who had also died of AIDS, all of them. They were all there to support him get from this world to the next. Wow. Oh, that's so beautiful. That gives me goosebumps just to hear that story. But that is the caliber of a lot of these stories. They're, they tend to be beautiful and they're very touching. And even the, you know, reuniting with someone who may have died a long time before, kind of resolving the patient's grief that they may have lived with much of their lives and being able, able to see and talk with someone from from earlier in their lives before they die. It's a, it's, it's really beautiful and really heartwarming when you see it. And so that's why I feel, I feel compelled to make sure that we don't ever take away the beauty of it for a family member. Sometimes I think by trying to explain it somehow and medical science is, has this tendency to always have to find a physical basis for everything like, oh, it's just because there, there's not enough oxygen to the brain. It's a side effect from the medications the patient's on. I think we're far better off not trying to explain it, not, not saying we don't know. We don't know what's happening. We can't explain this right now, but just in, enjoy the beauty of this moment. Oh, I think it's so important because when we're at the bedside in those days to hours before death, we, the watchers, are on edge. We're frightened. We're, we're confused about what's happening. People don't die like they do in the movies, and yet people don't know that. And so in the movies, Judy Dent says something very profound, and then she closes her eyes and her mouth, and she's dead. But in real life, it's not like that. And so the watchers are frightened because mom's not doing what Judy Dench did in the movies. And it's our job as healthcare professionals to bring comfort and support to those watchers. And part of that is explaining that mom's doing a good job and that mom is is in a reality that is different than ours. And let's listen to her. Let's hear what her reality is. She's telling a story. What is the story she's telling? And then, you know, we, the healthcare prof professional, professional is neutralizing the fear 
that <laughs> something bad is happening. And hopefully helping them touch into the sacredness and the beauty of this final passage from this world to the next. Yeah. And, and I know um, sometimes patients, they, they, they're not necessarily seeing visions that they tell us about, but they may talk about things that make no sense to us. And so I've had families also just dismiss whatever, whatever grandma is saying, because it doesn't make any sense. She's out of her head right now. But actually, sometimes when you tune in and really listen, listen to what's being said, um, they may be talking in a dreamlike fashion, symbolically about things. And I know this came up in uh, Maggie Callanan's book, Final Gifts. Mm -hmm. And and I love that title because these are little gifts that families are given by their loved ones at the end of life. But people may talk about needing to pack their suitcase or um, finding the map so they can figure out where they're going. And, uh, and all of those symbols are telling us they're preparing for a journey somewhere else. And I find that really reassuring and really comforting to, to think of that. They're preparing in their own way and they're using symbolism to talk to us about it. Um, get my coat is another one. Um, I, I was on call one night and it's three o'clock in the morning and the family calls and tells me that mom is, is agitated and she keeps saying, get that pregnant woman out of my bed. Hmm. And she just was, there is a pregnant woman in my bed and get her out. So I go to the house. If you don't make those calls, uh, then you're going to wake up in the morning and find your patients in the ER. So you roll out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. And I get over there and um, this woman is, she's very agitated and she keeps saying there's a pregnant woman in her bed. And she was so agitated that I did get her a medication to um, relax a little bit. But I started thinking and really looking at her and her room, she had cancer of the liver and she, her belly was absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. And if I were up above my bed, looking down, I'd have thought there was a pregnant woman in that bed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have the ability to get out of our body. And I think she was looking and not knowing it was her, but there was a pregnant woman in that bed. Hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And it reminded me of my mom um, a day or so before she died. Uh, I was I had plans to go out for dinner. I was her caregiver. And two of her friends who hadn't seen her for a while said they would come and sit with her while I ate dinner. So that day I cleaned up my mom's room because company was coming over and straightened everything and, and picked things up. And then when I got home from dinner and her friends were there, they were really upset with me. And they said, what did you do with your mother's box? And I said, what? And they said, your mother is looking for a box that she said she keeps in her bed and it's not there. She can't find it anywhere. And she said that you cleaned up and you must have done something with it. And I said, no, there's no box. There's no box. I didn't do anything with it. But her friends were literally, they were upset with me because they thought, why are you hiding it from your mother? She needs it. And I was trying to explain to them, you know, sometimes people, they have ideas or they're seeing things or perceiving things that aren't real. And I said, there's no box. There has not been a box in her bed. And I didn't take it away and I didn't move it, but they were perceiving it very literally. And I think that happens oftentimes. Things don't just don't make sense to us, but um, there's something symbolic about it. And in my mom's case, I never was quite sure what she meant by that or what she was talking about. Maybe it was the idea of packing something though, you know, things that she, important things she wanted to take with her. Probably packing her memories, packing her bags to go on a trip. Yeah. Yeah. It's all symbolic. And sometimes we can translate the symbols and other times we just have to say, boy, I don't know what she meant, but it was something. 
Yeah. Yeah. And appreciate that, that, that she's having an experience that we are not part of, we're not privy to it. It's happening for her. And for me, that's really profound as well, because I realize I'm observing her in this, in doing this work, this labor, as you call it, of dying. And it's an experience I can't really perceive what's happening. I don't really know. I'm only looking from the outside. And that emphasizes for me how sacred it is, you know, how sa it's sacred for the person experiencing it. It's not meant for all the rest of us to be part of or to understand. Right. I, you know, and I can't prove this, but it's what I think have, after working with so many people is that for them, the person that's dying and they're in that labor to get out of their body in the days to hours, um, even sometimes weeks, but generally days to hours, everything to them is like a dream. And it, you know how you can wake up some mornings and you go, oh my gosh, I dreamt last night and it was so real and I was so scared or I was so happy or whatever. I think in the days to hours before death, everything becomes like a dream. And dreams don't necessarily make sense when converted into physical reality. And we just have to accept that fact that we're hearing, hearing and witnessing their dream. That, yeah, that's a real, that's a really good analogy to use in a good way to think of it, that, that this is, is a dream or a vision or something that's happening for her. I'm witnessing it from the outside and I, and it's not for me. So I may never know what it's about or, or what it all really means. And I think something, I think that I know from, from what you've told me before, you would agree with this. We have to be careful that we as hospice workers don't add our interpretation into the situation because some of us may have religious or spiritual beliefs that cause us to see this ex experience a certain way, but we have to make sure that we're not pushing that in a way onto the patient and their family, that we stay neutral about that because it's for them, it is not an experience to validate our belief system. It's for, it's happening for them. And it's a thin line to walk to as a healthcare professional to constantly remember, and this is our job is to remember that this experience is not about us. It's not about our belief system. It is supporting the patient and family in their belief system, giving them as much education as we can, but not to give our own personal beliefs. It's not our experience. It's not our place to share. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's important all the way through the whole dying process that we walk that thin line, you know, that we be available like spiritually with our awareness and our presence to listen and hear whatever people need to share with us and, and um, whatever their perspective and interpretation is, but it's not a time when we should interject our own interpretation. Right. It's not ours. And I think because fear rides with everyone who is there at the bedside, watching this unknown experience. A lot of the time as healthcare professionals, just our presence, it isn't the words we say, it's being there with them uh, that brings the comfort and the support. And then to, to be able to say, yeah, mom's doing okay. Nothing bad is happening here but we don't have to have words. It's our presence that is so valuable during the time of dying. 
Exactly. Just being open hearted and being able, being able to sit there without fear on our own parts. When we come in and we're calm, we create this, this calm presence and safe space in the room that helps everyone else feel more comfortable with what's happening. Well, and, you know, our job is to help the family have a sacred experience. And I'm not, I don't use the word sacred in terms of religion. I use the word sacred in, in the meaning of a meaningful, positive experience. And they will carry that sacred experience as a memory with them forever. And that to me is our main job. The death is the goal and everything that we do works up to that moment of death. And then our relationship then becomes more distant gradually during the time of grief. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think I probably shared this story with you before about my own mom. Like when my, when it was time for my mom to die, she had been very spiritual all of her life. And she had had a lot of spiritual experiences she had told me about. So I really expected like, this is going to be amazing when she's dying. Like she's going to tell me things. She's going to see things. My dad's going to come for her. She's going to describe all this to me. I, you know, I was just there ready and waiting to listen in to all these visions I thought she would have and all these things she would say. And after like in the last, I think a day and a half of her life, the only thing she said to me was, I want onion rings. And I was so disappointed, like, ah, oh, you know, I thought this was going to be some like amazing, mind blowing experience. And she's asking for onion rings. I was, I was disappointed at first, but then, um, I talked to, I talked to someone else about it who said, well, who's to say she, who's to say onion rings weren't part of her vision and her spiritual experience or whatever she was happening, whatever was happening for her at that time. And, you know, like, I can't judge that. I don't know. It had to do with onion rings. I did remember later that she, when she was a teenager, she worked as a car hop at one, at a little um, drive-in and she got to have a free meal after her shift and she I remember her telling me onion rings were her favorite thing so she would always have onion rings after her shift and later I thought oh maybe she was kind of doing a life review she was remembering being 14 and working as a car hop and eating onion rings and then it, that you know I realized that's sweet that's that's lovely that she was having that memory and it was of something really positive for her. And so my fault, my attachment that I thought, she, I thought there would be something, something profound and miraculous, but it's a great story because I do believe that we do a life review. I mean, we think about months before that, once you've been told that you can't be fixed, you start thinking about your life. What have I done? Who have I touched? And that gradually goes from maybe in the months before death, sharing it and talking about it. But I think it also, as we get closer to death, goes into our being an unconscious level um, where we're doing a life review. Who have I done? You know, it's like, Life is a billion piece jigsaw puzzle. And we're trying to put all those puzzle, puzzle pieces together to show us who we are. And I love that you came to terms with the onion rings because that, that makes so much sense to me, you know, that that was a part of her life. And she's processing and that little piece of the puzzle kind of got yeah. <laughs> just that little snippet, but, it, and it's actually sweet now because if I'm ever in a place where we order onion rings for some reason, I mean, it's just such a sweet connection with my mom and a tender. And, uh, I love having that little, that little tiny memory. Like you said, that little piece of the puzzle, it's still something I can instantly 
I, I can instantly remember being there at her bedside and and being with her as soon as I think about onion rings. And so it was an, it was a, a nice little gift that she that she gave in that. Yeah, um, you know, and our job is to help families recognize the gifts, to help <laughs> them find the gifts. Um, it's it's kind of the old story about the the barn filled with manure and looking for the pony. Um, I think that um, because of our own fears, we the watchers um, really can relate to those little treasures. Uh, but it's up to us, the healthcare professionals who are there to help the family recognize mm -hmm. the treasures um, so that they can have those in their heart with them forever. Yeah, that the onion rings weren't just nonsense. That's right. something you can remember and take with you. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another type of experience that I have, I, I guess I have witnessed it a couple of times um, in hospice patients, but I've heard about it more often from family members, which is, we call it terminal lucidity, but it's when, uh, in the, the case of one of our patients who had end-stage Alzheimer's, he had not been verbal for about two years before he died. He hadn't been able to speak at all. And shortly before he died, a couple of nights before his wife, her kind of like you heard with your mom, she heard him talking in the other room. She thought it was someone else had come in the house. She heard a voice in the other room and went in and it was her husband who was speaking to people in the room, even though he had not been verbal for two years. And so um, that's another phenomenon that I've heard about and, and I witnessed it with one other patient and heard about with many other patients. But another thing that we we cannot explain, why does someone who hasn't been able to speak for all of this time, why are they suddenly able to in, in this moment shortly before they die? Well, it's so interesting. I, I've started calling it the calm before the storm. You know, you can have a person that's been non-responsive and a, you know, and all of a sudden they wake up and say, I want a steak dinner. And the family is like, the miracle has happened. Our prayers have been answered. Dad's going to be better. And then 48 hours later, dad's dead. And it's like, what in the world was all that about? And I think that we get as, as our physical energy decreases, I think we become filled with spiritual energy. And that spiritual energy to make our transition laps over into the physical. And, and there's that brief moment of, of being aware of lucidity, as you say. Um, and then it's gone. Uh, but I think it's that extra energy to make that change. And it's a gift. It's, mm -hmm. it's a little extra gift that we are able to give. And I, re for this woman, it definitely was, she got to hear her husband's voice again and hear him speaking. And he, uh, like, uh, it's like some of our other patients we've talked about was talking from what she could glean to departed family members who had, who were in the room and had already died. So she got that, the gift of hearing his voice of kind of being able to see him as whole again, in a way, as the the person she had known before who had really disappeared from her for a few years. And um, she got this little moment of, of seeing that again and also knowing his family's here, they're here for him and he won't be alone. So I thought that was just a really beautiful and profound story. It is, yes. Another thing, though, is as much as when we talk about these stories, people, well, like me, I wanted it to, you know, I wanted it to happen. I wanted to have a more profound experience than um, I perceived was happening with my mom. But we really, we can't make them happen. We don't know why they happen, but we can't make them happen either. And so as much as some families may wish for it to happen, it, it may not. And that's fine, too. That's perfectly normal. Well, and... And we just have to keep remembering it's not our story. 
it's not about us. Uh, we, the watchers, can participate. We can be there. We can love. We can support. But it's not our story. It's not our ending. And so whatever our expectations are, the person that's dying, they haven't read the playbook. You know, they're going to die in their own manner, according to their own personality. Yeah. And another thing that I witnessed with my mom was a lot of agitation and restlessness in the last 12 hours or so before she died, kicking the covers off, picking at things, you know, and, and I could, I couldn't understand what was happening for her in that moment. Was she too hot? Was she cold? Was she uncomfortable? And, but, um, but that's also a behavior that we, that we witness fairly fairly commonly with patients. That is one of the key things that tells me a person's labor has begun. One to three weeks before death, you walk in a room and the person is sound asleep with their eyes partially open and their, their mouth open. And they may be picking their clothes, working their bed sheets, picking the air, um, this, these random, not making any sense movements, um, that I don't know why it happens, but I have learned that that's when labor begins. Yeah. So when we see those behaviors, once again, it's a norm, it's normal. It not, it doesn't happen for everyone, but it's com common and it's a normal part of the dying process. So we need to remind families not to be afraid of that when they witness it. And we also don't need to medicate the patient or sedate them to try to get rid of those behaviors. They're, they're part of the process of dying. Oh, they're, they're natural, normal ways that um, we get out of our body. You know, that's part of how we release. I don't know why, but I've witnessed it enough to know that that's part of how we get out of our body. Yeah. Again, in my, another little story in my mom's case, um, first of all, my mom's a person who the, her whole adult life, as long as I've known her, she was always too cold. She was always putting on sweaters and coats and turning the heat up and sleeping with an electric blanket. And so I was very diligent as she was di dying to make sure she had enough covers on her bed and constantly checking and making sure she had her covers on. But when she got to this state of restlessness, she kept kicking the covers off. You know, I'd leave for a couple of minutes and come back in and there she is with no covers on. And I'd cover her up again and tuck everything in and, you know, over and over, we did this multiple times. And finally, at one point, my mom, who again, who she hadn't spoken at all, said, I'm hot. <laughs> And suddenly I realized, oh, wait, no wonder she's, she, I'm, she's having to kick the covers off because I'm overheating her. And then I also realized, well, that is some of part of the work of dying as well is that the body might be releasing heat. And so unexpectedly for me, I, I, it didn't occur to me that she would be too hot and that she might need, um, need the covers off so that she could cool down and get comfortable. Yeah, well, and I think that we can take our cues from the person that's dying from their behavior, even if they're non-responsive, even if they're not making sense, we can take their cues. Um, and that can be physical positioning. It can be the covers. It, you know, um, we want them to be comfortable um, and I think we forget as we see them non-responsive that their actions can tell us mm -hmm. what's going on without having any words. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's good to note that me, even with tons of hospice experience and being with lots of patients as they were dying, all of that went out the window when I'm there with my own mom and trying to figure out what she needs and how to care for her. So granted, 
most caregivers in the home, they just, they won't necessarily understand what's happening or it may not come naturally to know what to do for their loved one and how to handle it. When, when the hospice nurse came for the first time to the house and I had trained her, um, (laughs) and she had worked for me for years. Um, I said, Jean, I am Barbara, Dorothy's daughter. I am not Barbara, used to be director of the hospice, you know. So one time we were, Jean was there and I have her out away from my mother. And I say to her, how long do you think it's going to be? And my husband is walking by. And he hears me say this, and Jean and I then are talking about it. And after Jean left, my husband said, what in the world? Why were you asking her how long you think it's going to be? You trained her. You know, this is what you do. And I said, no, Barbara, the daughter is just Barbara, the daughter, not the nurse. And so... I think that's an important thing for us healthcare workers to remember when it's personal, it isn't about our knowledge. It's about our heart and our emotions that, that we're dealing with. And so we have, I think we should have support um, to guide us through no matter how much we know. Yeah. I I remember my mom's hospice. They knew, you know, that I, that I worked in hospice and kind of said, you know, you probably don't even want the social worker or the chaplain to stop in because you are, you know, all this, you don't need us. And I desperately wanted them to come. I wanted all the support I could get, send everybody in, give us a volunteer. I want everybody. I need, I need support because taking care of your own loved one is completely different than taking care of a patient that you barely know. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I've got time. Okay. Um, Mother and I had an off and on relationship. It's how people's relationships are. So one day we had a disagreement and I thought to myself, I don't love her. I don't know when I stopped, but I don't love her. And I was so devastated with this. I called the hospice social worker and Diane said, I will be right over. And we go in the bedroom and I'm crying and carrying on. And she said, Barbara, love is a verb. Love is an action word. And you are loving your mother. I have held to that. (laughs) That was just such an amazing gift. Um, I will also say the gift is that by the time my mother died, I did love her as a noun. Uh, And probably our best five months in our whole life was those five months while she was in my home dying. Hmm. Yeah, that touches my heart because I had a similar experience in a way though I I only took care of my mom for five days before she died but they were amazing days where we we covered a lot of territory even without talking about it I think in terms of forgiving each other for things that had happened in the past and uh, it it was um, I mean that's why one of the reasons I recommend if you have a chance to care for a loved one as they're dying it's a it's incredible what can happen for you and what can heal and transform and change within. And so um, it it was the most powerful experience I've ever had. Yeah, it's it's a gift. It's a gift. And that's where we who work in end of life, that's a big part of our goal is to help the families have that special experience. Yeah, it's so true. So then that brings us back to our original topic, whatever is happening 
for the patient, whatever the patient, if they're seeing something or hearing something or talking about something that doesn't make sense, help the family sit with it and receive it and even view it as this, this is something positive that's happening and um, receive it and take it as a gift that maybe right now you don't understand. It may not make sense to you, but these words your loved one is saying, they may come back to you over and over and become precious to you over time. Oh, taking care of someone at end of life um, can be a gift. Um, it's hard, probably the hardest work you're going to do. I strongly recommend support, whether it's an end of life doula or hospice. Uh, so, you know, even the church ladies, you need, as a caregiver, you need support and help so that you aren't totally buried and miss the gift that you, the opportunity of the gift that you've been given. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good way to, to put it, the opportunity of the gift. And then I think both of us would attest from our personal stories that sometimes your loved one is a person with whom you have a complicated relationship. And you may feel like, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can be with, with my mom. Like we have way too much negative history and too much pain between us. And we've hurt each other too many times. But I found being willing to be with her and to try to give her what she needed in spite of anything that had happened in the past, it, it ch changed everything and it transformed everything. So don't imagine that there's someone that you, you couldn't possibly provide care for because, um, if you're being called to do it, because it's what, it's what is coming up and, and what's happening for you. I personally say, don't shy away from it. If you're able, if you're able to go and able to help and be there. Well, it's a gift. It's an absolute gift. Um, and I hope that you have support and, and a listener, uh, while you're doing it, um, so that you can appreciate the gift at the moment. Um, I also think it's important when a person is non-responsive, when they're not going to argue back with you, that you go in and talk to that person who's dying and talk about the positive, but also talk about the negative times. Um, that is healing for us who stay here on this earth, but it's also healing for the person that's dying because they're processing their life and um, do it when they're non-responsive uh, because it's easier than someone who's going to yell at you. Um, but I think that that's a very healing thing that I try to get all my families to do. Absolutely. And we, you know, what we believe at least is that hearing is the last of the senses to go and that um, recognize your loved one most likely can hear you. And that if you need healing over something that's happened in the past, your loved one probably does too. Your loved one probably is looking for that and needs that as well. So don't feel like it, it wouldn't be right to talk about issues that have been there between you. And, um, because that may be exactly what your loved one needs needs to hear at wh wherever they are, whatever state they're in, that might be exactly what helps them tie up loose ends and finish their business as well. Oh, such a good point. Yes, it's, it's not always just about us, you know, and um, it, it's the opportunity to clean the slate. And for both, as you pointed out, absolutely for both. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I wanted to, to mention again, I, I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Christopher Kerr. He's a hospice doctor in Buffalo, New York at Hospice Buffalo. He's done research 
on these kinds of end of life experiences we've been talking about, like deathbed visions and dreams. He says in his hospice, at least what they've found through surveys is, is as many as 88% of their patients have some sort of an experience like this, which is, that's a lot higher than I even realized, but that's when they started really asking people about it. They found that all of these experiences we've just described are very common. And I think sometimes the reason we don't always hear about it is some people may worry that it's not normal. And so some family members who saw their loved one talking <laughs> to someone in the corner, they may not share that with us because they may be afraid that it, it's, it was abnormal and, you know, mom's lost her mind and she's she's crazy now but they so they may be afraid to say anything and i think that could be one reason why it's good for us to remember we can even tell families in advance if that it's very common for loved ones to have unusual experiences as they get closer to dying like this so don't worry if you see that happen i don't know if if you've done that but i think we can sometimes normalize it even before it's happened absolutely you know, 90% of our work is education. And part of educating is to helping the family understand that nothing bad is happening, nothing pathological is happening. And so as part of our teaching, I think it's really important to say, you know, dad may talk, he may say, things that don't make any sense or talk to and then you planted the seed so that when it does happen it's like oh yeah you know hospice told me that was going to happen yeah yeah and that's the value of you know your booklets that you've written that are available for people the more people are prepared and know what to expect when their loved one is in the in the dying stage um, the the easier it will be for them to offer support to their loved one and to navigate all of it without fear. And so that includes um, being prepared that some some of these non-ordinary experiences could happen. Yeah, knowledge reduces fear. Um, and people under stress do not have the energy to read a whole book, but they'll read 10, 12 pages of large print. And that's why I have written the way I have, um, so that you can sit down and read it in 30 minutes and get some knowledge and support and guidance. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's just, it's so important. So those of us who work in hospice, we need to make sure we're giving lots of education to family members so they feel prepared for whatever they might experience, um, including, I guess we can call them non-ordinary. I'm not sure if there's a better term than that, because I want to take away the, uh, you know, anything uh, frightening or negative about how we refer to these experiences. So I don't know if there's a better term than non-ordinary um, phenomena that happen at the end of life, but um, but we can help turn that event that no one can explain into something that really can be a blessing for the family and comfort to them and help them later on with their grief as they look back at, at how these last days unfolded. And have a positive memory. Yeah. Having a positive memory is so important because yeah. it will support us through the rest of our life. Um, it's important. Absolutely. We'll be eating onion rings and we'll <laughs> remember <laughs> that special time. And sometimes those stories, they're sweet and sometimes they're funny, like, like the onion ring story, you know, there there's humor in it. And, and that's a real gift too, to be able to carry something in your heart that makes you smile. Oh, so important, you know, to find the joy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, anything else, Barbara? Anything else you want to talk about on this topic? I think we covered a lot of good territory. I am so pleased that we're bringing it out of the shadows, actually, because it is a topic that isn't talked about a lot. And yet anyone who has taken care of someone 
who is dying has probably had some kind of an experience. So I hope that by us talking about it, they can then look back and go, oh yeah, mom did that too. And it was okay. And, and it's okay to remember, we can't really explain these experiences. And that's all right, too, even, even though as healthcare providers, we think we should always have an answer. And it's okay to say, no one knows for sure why they happen, but we know that they're common. And they're not a sign that anything is wrong. Everything's okay. I think that's the very best way to explain it. Take yourself out of feeling like you somehow have to come up with some explanation that will make sense to the family of why it's happening. It's okay to just say, we don't know. We don't know why this happens. But it happens. And it but happens a lot. Yes. Yes, definitely. That's, that's perfect. Well, thank you, Barbara. It's always, it's just so much fun to talk with you. And I, I love how we can really dig into a subject matter and we have both have a lot of stories to share and that's really fun as well. I really appreciate our relationship and our getting together. And you're right. We can just talk about just about anything. And it, <laughs> it's fun. I enjoy it and we'll do it again. I, I enjoy it as well. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the next time. So thanks again, Barbara, and take care. Okay. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Barbara Carnes. I love talking to Barbara. I'm sure it shows. We always have a wonderful time together and uh, dig into lots of stories from our hospice days. So I hope you found it valuable as well. Be sure and tell other people about this content if you think someone else might benefit from listening. And uh, as I said, subscribe and leave ratings and reviews for the podcast. That will make a big difference. So thanks again for tuning in. And I'll be back next week with another little video for you. So until then, take care.